Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper. Just a reminder, this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to discuss your concerns. You can find my audio books, self-help books, and devotional books on Amazon. My videos are on YouTube, and you can listen to my podcast, Life Without Baggage, on your favorite platform. This really stuck out to me early in my Christian life, where he says, my burden is light and easy to be borne. So if my yoke is easy and my burden is light, what does that mean? Well, I grew up with a lot of rules connected to God, and that if you wanted to please God and avoid punishment, you you needed to follow these rules and you better do them exactly right, or there were going to be problems and God would be mad at you. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying his yoke is light, it's wholesome, it's good, and his burden is light. So I looked up yoke. One of the things that's talked about in the, um, it's called commentaries. You can look up what a passage of scripture means, and there's different experts that will make comments about what they think it means. So what the commentaries talk about are some different things. But in the old days, a farmer used oxen and put a yoke over his shoulders so that the oxen would plow in a certain direction. And Jesus use, uses the picture of a yoke that we can choose to be yoked with him so that he's actually doing the heavy lifting. And that's what makes it light. And that's what makes it not burdensome because Jesus is carrying most of the weight and he gives us his Holy Spirit so that we have the power to make better choices. Another aspect of yoke is what we choose to, to align ourselves with, couple ourselves to. And we can be yoked to the law, we can be yoked to our own sin, or we can be yoked to Jesus. Maybe some of you remember the old Bob Dylan song, You Gotta Serve Somebody. We're going to serve somebody. If we're serving ourselves, then we're gonna be yoked to sin. We can be yoked to the law or religion, religious performance, which is not true faith. It's rules. And Jesus is saying, I'm the one that does the heavy lifting. I paid for your sins. I'm your good shepherd. So if you align yourself with me, I can help you do right. I want to read Psalm 23, 3. He refreshes and restores my life. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It says also in John, John chapter 1, verse 17, For while the law was given through Moses, grace, undeserved favor and spiritual blessing, and truth came through Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, there were laws to follow. There were sacrifices that need to be made to appease for the sins of the people. But Jesus came once for all to pay for our sins and then to give us his Holy Spirit so that we could walk in power and have communion with God and power to live a good life and to be a positive influence to others. That's why it says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There are still principles that lead us into good things that are pleasing to God, but it's not keeping the rules that pleases God. It's that connection with Jesus Christ. So it's, it, it seems as though people lean towards and churches lean towards teaching God's goodness and ignoring his righteousness or teaching his righteousness but ignoring his goodness and the power that comes through the Holy Spirit, not through following rules. So that's one of the reasons people have trouble understanding who God is and enjoying who he is. So um, I'm going to quote from, first of all, the Bible study, Breaking Through to Blessing. Much has been written on the way we subconsciously associate the shortcomings of parents or authority figures or churches with the way we view God. If I was abandoned, ignored, or left to grow up on my own, it'll be hard to believe that God loves me 
and is concerned about my well-being. If parents held grudges or gave me the silent treatment when I disappointed them, then I may have trouble recognizing that God is quick to forgive me. I may feel unworthy of love. I may worry about being good enough. Or I may even resist love if I've already decided I'm not worthy of being loved. If I'm carrying guilt, shame, or self-rejection, then I'm less likely to recognize or be comfortable with seeing God or other people as loving. Again, I may have decided I'm not lovable, so God can't love me. Religious teaching that overemphasizes rules, or the law as Jesus called it, causes people to see God as angry and eager to punish. Religious teaching or culture can also overly emphasize God's love to the point that we lose grasp of his holiness. And both extremes of God as being loving and accepting of everything or of God being very quick to anger, both extremes give us a distorted view of God. So this does show the importance of reading God's word and asking his Holy Spirit to teach us. So that was from the Bible study. Now I'm going to read um, a few sections from my book on correcting distortions. This is on page uh, 28 and 29. Add to this a home where there's favoritism or a lot of competition between the kids or between parent and child, and that can create perfectionism and unrealistic expectations. Individuals in this kind of environment need to prove themselves over and over to get attention or validation. There's a sense that they're never good enough. Sometimes they just can't sit still and relax because that would be lazy. They can become workaholics, overly driven to achieve, or unduly focused on pleasing others in order to prove their worth. So it's easy to see how these things contaminate our view of God. If we're hard on ourselves, we'll assume that God looks at us the same way. If we grew up with someone who was too hard on us, then we're likely to assume that God looks at us harshly. Expectations and undercurrents impact how we think God views us and how we think God judges us. So it's necessary to forgive ourselves and to forgive other people for those original imbalances that stir up all the confusion. I've got some thoughts on perfectionism here too. So some people think of perfectionism as needing to be perfect, but I think it shows up in many other forms. Similar to perfectionism is self-criticism where I'm never happy with myself, my performance, my behavior, my status. I constantly push myself and compare myself to other people. Perfectionism can also show up as expectations that I must handle everything well without help in spite of how I'm feeling or how many other things are happening. Perfectionism can also look like demands I place on myself to do more, be more efficient, and try harder. So this translates spiritually into what the Bible calls striving. It's the idea that if I try hard enough, God will be happy with me or I won't hate myself. But the Bible teaches that we're loved and valued by God apart from our efforts. If you think about it, the religious people in the Bible who were big on rules and short on love were the Pharisees. They're the ones that attacked and argued with Jesus and had him crucified. Jesus confronted them about their pride and spiritual blindness. When our faith is driven by the need to earn God's approval, we've lost our bearings. You can see how it's easy to get stuck in a view of God that's based on our performance instead of his payment for our sin. It's hard to maintain joy or peace if we're approaching God with an attitude of perfectionism, striving, or shame. So what can you do about this? Well, I've got some different questions you can ask yourself. I'm going back now to some things that I uh, that are in the Bible study, chapter 3. Ask yourself, maybe make some journal notes, what did your church experiences teach you about God's love and his willingness to forgive? What did your family experiences teach you about what makes a person lovable? A view of men, the view of women, what happens when you fail or make a mistake? And what do you believe deep down about your worth, your sense of belonging, your value right now at your present age, your present weight, your present financial status, or your sense of competence? 
So we've talked about the need to get to know God directly for yourself through his word, not through other people's uh, writings, not through other messages. Although those things are very good and helpful, obviously, since I do a lot of that myself, writing. Um, But you need your own personal relationship with God where you allow him to directly encounter him through his word, through his presence, through quiet time with him. And I I go through a lot of that in my first three podcasts, so I'm not going to repeat that here. I mentioned also that it's important to forgive ourselves and to forgive other people. And I have a podcast on that, on resentments. So I'm going to do something just a little bit different with the prayer today. I'm going to walk you through four steps. And you can either pause and do this or come back to it later. But first, we're going to identify where maybe one distortion comes from. Then secondly, choose to forgive it by an act of your will. It doesn't mean that what happened is okay, but if you want to unload something that is a source of a distortion, you need to choose to forgive what the person did to you and the harm it's caused. Third, we want to confess any sinful responses in our attitudes or behavior. And then fourth, we want to release any pain or negative emotions into Jesus' body on the cross after we have forgiven and confessed our reactions. So let's do that. So first, identify in your own heart and mind anything where you know you have um, some kind of injury or situation where there was enough problems for you that there is probably a distortion, something with criticism or rejection. Secondly, I would encourage you to say out loud, I choose to forgive by an act of my will and then name that person. Next, again, I would have you say this out loud. There's more power in the spoken word. I confess to you, Lord Jesus, sinful responses that I had to this injury and then name anything you did or any attitudes of bitterness. Then finally, you can release the negative emotions, pain, fear, anger, into Jesus' body on the cross. So go ahead and ask him to take the negative emotions. Jesus paid for the sins we committed, but he also paid for the sins committed against us. So if you've done those things, now I can pray for you. Lord, thank you for this person's desire to be free. I pray that you would bless them, strengthen them, and break any subconscious connections that they have made in their heart, mind, or deep in their soul between you and these negative people or negative hurtful experiences. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. Thanks for listening, and if this helped you, share it with a friend.